Hi everybody, Dean Wilson here. We're so glad you're with us wherever you are. If you're joining us on television in Santa Barbara, California area, we welcome you and so many of you joining us around the world on these different platforms. We are in Los Angeles today. Um, it's a special day. It's a high honor for us to uh, be joined by Her Excellency, the First Lady of the Republic of Kenya, uh, Rachel Ruto. Yes, you can clap. <laughs> Uh, and, and I'm also joined here, uh, we are joined by my dear friend, an incredible man of God, uh, Dr. Gershom Sakala is with you. And some of you may have seen Gershom's story on Good Life. Uh, I was able to have him on and he shared his testimony. And it was one of the more powerful uh, moments that we've had on this program. So I, I encourage you to watch that. It's an amazing story. But uh, First Lady Ruto, welcome to the United States and welcome to Los Angeles. Thank you very much. Uh, we're honored to have you here. Uh, talk a little bit about your the beginning of your time as First Lady and what your hopes are for the Republic of Kenya. Thank you very much, uh, Dean. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first, just allow me to also say a great thank you to uh, Dr. Gershom yes. for this great uh, event that we've had this afternoon and uh, just to thank the Almighty God uh, it's one thing to come from Kenya and just come and visit the U.S., but it's another thing also to be able to have the privilege of having this interview. So thank you so much. So um, maybe just to say, first of all, that I'm a born-again Christian. I love Jesus as Lord and Savior of my life. Uh, but I was brought up in a Christian family and later got born again when I was 13 years old. And since then, I've been serving God. And of course, got married to my husband, who loves the Lord also and is born again. So I became First Lady of the Republic of Kenya not long ago. We're just going into nine months uh, because the, the elections were held in August of last year. And the president was inaugurated into office on the 13th of September of last year. But to say, just before that, my husband had been member of parliament, so he had been in the National Assembly for about 15 years, and uh, a deputy president or vice president, as you'd call it, in the U.S. for 10 years. So um, that really uh, gave me a very good foundation and a very good platform to be able to do the work that I love to do and I continue to do. So I started working with Women Economic Empowerment as a program uh, in 2009, and uh, I founded an organization then that uh, we call Joyful Women. And the story of women economic empowerment and Joyful Women is when my husband first became, or was vying to become member of parliament in 1997, I was working in the villages, talking to women and young people. And I met these women that were seated under a tree. And when I went to talk to them, what I noticed about one particular woman was that she was very, um, joyful, she was very happy. She looked like she had not had breakfast, looked like she was a manchette, but then what I noticed was that she did not have shoes. So I just made a prayer to God and I told God, if my husband makes it to parliament, I would like to come back and do something with these women. And I was looking for sustainability because it's always good to do something that is sustainable. At least it's good to teach people how to fish. So uh, many years later, 12 years down the road, I came across a concept that had been written by the government of Kenya on the concept of table banking. So in this concept of table banking, women come together. Every woman in Africa is in what we call a chama, is in a group. So they come together, they put their funds, uh, they bring their funds together, like something like crowdfunding, maybe that is the closest I can say in the US, but then they borrow that money and they use it for enterprises. And so, by the grace of God, on the 31st of August of 2009, we founded Joyful Women Organization. And we called it Joyful Women Organization because of that one woman that did not have shoes, looked like had not even had breakfast, but was very joyful. And so, we say that uh, we want this joy, you know, to be found in every home. 
in every village, in every church. Because when you touch the life of a woman and a woman is happy, everybody in the community is happy. Yeah. So when my husband became a deputy president in 2013, I continued to do women economic empowerment. And even now, in the office of the first lady, I continue to do women economic empowerment. But, but of course, as a first lady, when you become the mother of the nation, so many things come. So I'm doing many things beyond uh, women economic empowerment, maybe with, which I will mention later. But to say that, the foundation of all this has been prayer yes. and loving God. You know, the Bible says, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world yes. and lose their life? Yes. So I have always known that without God, it's not easy. But with God, all things yes. are possible. Yes. Uh, and so Dr. Gershom, because I wanted to ask you, because I think sometimes we pray for when we were told to pray for our leaders that's in the scripture and to honor our leaders which we hope we're doing here today um, but isn't it amazing when god delivers one to a position of authority like he has the president and the first lady i think that's something to celebrate don't you that's something we need to celebrate uh, the problem is christians wants to attack each other when when you see uh, excellence standing up for God and standing up for women. I would encourage all Christians globally to rally toward her because not every nation has got uh, our excellency like her. And I've interviewed so many people. And it's a duty, it's my duty as a minister to pray for her and to cover them and pray. And it's your duty you as a believers to cover them and pray. And not only that, it's very important to also support financially so that because the world is moved by the material but God is moved by the spirit heart so we that's why it's very important thank yes. you thank you yeah I was gonna ask a little bit about that because sometimes um, as you know and have experienced in politics it's very combative very a lot of fighting a lot of division and we're we're doing that a lot in our country <laughs> these days, and I think you've been through probably your fair share uh, in, in your elections. How do you transition to a place where, because as the first lady, as the first mother of, the, of a country of 50 million people or so, um, how do you move beyond the politics of the moment and really prayerfully think, work, partner with people on behalf of the people? I think uh, for me, when my husband was elected as president, he was not elected president for the people that voted for him. He was elected president for the Republic of Kenya. So for me, and even I've heard him say many times, is just to know that you are not for these particular people that voted, because of course you know the numbers, because right. you know you're told several millions have voted for you, the others did not vote. But you see, when God puts you in that position, and then you take everyone under the same roof as a president and a first lady. So for me, when I look at the people of Kenya, I look at them as one, yeah. not as people who voted different ways yeah. or on different divides. So that is what has really been the drive, just to know that God has given us an opportunity. And it's a rare opportunity. I mean, like, how many people want to be presidents? So we cannot afford to discriminate the people of Kenya but we take them as one people. And these are people that God has given us the responsibility to be able to do what we need to do. And so we look at them like one, and we serve them without any discrimination. Beautiful, beautiful. I, I, I wanted to share this. I, I didn't know this information um, until today. So 75% of the Kenyan population is under 35 years old, I was told. And the average age in, in Kenya is 19. You're a very young country. Uh, as you think about the future, there's a, obviously something uh, amazing that we're all hoping and praying for. But talk specifically about what you, it, with an average age of 19 in a country, I mean, this is, there's a major future here 
upon you as a as a demographic group. How do you how do you think? How do you pray? What do you see? What do you hope to see for the future of the country? I think we are a very privileged country, like many other African countries, to to have a young population or uh, young people, because we know that uh, you know when we were growing up, we used to be told that uh, you are the future of yes. tomorrow and now we are old. So it is really the opportunity for these young people. And of course we know that uh, as a continent, and even just coming down to Kenya, we have been faced with a lot of uh, challenges, especially the issues of unemployment among our young people. And we know that we are churning so many uh, young people out of our universities and colleges, but then the opportunity maybe for work is not there. But we look at it as a great opportunity. And my husband, the president, has a whole, um, uh, you know, everything has been laid out on how he wants to work with the youth. Because what the government is running with is issues of agriculture, issues of affordable housing, issues of uh, the creative economy and the digital superhighway. Because we know that the young people that we have, of course, have to be in this space. So. Um, uh, that is what my husband is doing, just to make sure that in these uh, opportunities that he has, in these different pillars and sectors, that there can be opportunities for young people in order to create employment. If I could talk about affordable housing, for example, he's saying that it's not just about building houses, but you see who are these young people that are going to work, you know, we need the plumbers to work in these places, we need, uh, you know, the people, uh, the artisans to go work in these houses, and this is going to be our young people. We also realize that there are opportunities outside our country and in other places like even in the US. So government has been talking to other countries to see if some of our young people can also get opportunities outside. And the other thing also is uh, in terms of digital creativity is that uh, the government has put hotspots of Wi-Fi in villages so that young people can be able to get these jobs and work abroad. You could be sitting in your village back at home, but you work with a company abroad. So for me, I see that uh, the fact that we have a young population is a very good opportunity for Africa. And we know that really, Africa is the place to look because of the young population yes, that we have. absolutely. Wonderful. And would you just comment briefly on any... Uh, would you just talk about the importance of the family? Actually, in one of the programs that we run in my office uh, called the Faith Diplomacy, mm -hmm. one of the directorates or one of the departments is uh, family values. Uh, without a family, we cannot have a nation. Without a family, we cannot even have the church. That is what we keep saying. So uh, it's really been our desire in our nation to see that the family is together. We see uh, rates of separation and divorce, and we see marriages that don't even celebrate the first anniversary because of issues that are coming to interfere with the society. But I just want to encourage everybody, like, let's hold on to the family because uh, family is everything. When a mother, when a father is there, when children are together, they get to learn the word of God and they get to do things together and then we'll have a very stable nation and that will make uh, the nations of the world to be stable. Amen. Uh, that's, that's so powerful. Uh, I mean, when, when I think about God creating the institution of the family, I think sometimes we can forget. You know, God didn't create, you know, 16 institutions. I mean, he, he kind of kept it pretty, like he, he, he wanted the family unit to be, and that, and that to me, that's such a, an amazing. Do you have another thought on that, Gershom, that you want to share? Uh, the very powerful, uh, if we want to be stronger, we need families to be stronger. Communities will never be stronger without families. Yes. So that's why the enemy is attacking families. There's war on families. So I excellence by, a, through our initiative of faith to bring families together, it's huge. Me as a, as a leader and, uh, and the father to many in the faith, one thing I've seen that uh, marriages is one of the very key that can strengthen a church. And marriages is the same one that the devil wants to destroy. So um, I really love what I excellent said. 
Yeah, and congratulations on 32 years of marriage and six children. <laughs> seven, sorry, seven. Seven. Seven is the number of perfection. That's right, we stopped at five. That's all we can do. But uh, I love that. Uh, well, uh, we are grateful for you. We're grateful for your faith. I think what you said earlier about prayer, I had a mentor one time tell me, he said, Dean, because I would always want to get into the work. And he said, Dean, Prayer is the work. You know, he said, prayer is the work. Then you could go fool around with all your stuff. Prayer is the work. And I thought, that's a foundational thought. You know, I, I think there was maybe somebody in our White House once said, you, you know, who, who, as a president, he said, I was driven to my knees by the weight. I mean, I, I assume that the president and, and yourself feel that weight. And so we'll be praying for you as you carry that uh, and by the power of God and the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life, which is clear and evident. And I just have a really wonderful um, vision for what Kenya is going to become. And, and, and so we bless you in the name of Jesus. And we thank you for joining us.